But um, just before I turn it over, I just want to um, say my learning with Trad's been both as a colleague and as a friend uh, and as an admirer of all the things he's exploring and the boundaries he's pushing with a lot of mycological work. Um, a lot of our work at the Cornell Small Farms Program is focused on cultivating mushrooms for food, um, but that's really just the tip of such a large iceberg, and Trad's really uh, swimming in that and, and going much deeper and has a lot of interesting insight to share, and I'm really excited about this topic in particular since we're all, a lot of us in this room and at the university are working with uh, crop and pest challenges, and I think uh, fungi have a lot to offer in that realm. So I'll turn it over to Chad. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, thank you for uh, having me here. Can you hear me all right? Yes. It's fine. Um, I've known Steve for uh, many years now, and um, He's one of my favorite co-presenters to hang out with at conferences and stuff. We just, we have a lot to talk about, a lot of interests. A um, little bit about me first before I get started. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been growing mushrooms for over 26 years and I got hired at 20 years old as a commercial cultivator while I was on a tour. Uh, I got hired and that's our new place. Um, Mushroom Mountain is focuses on cultivation and research that pays for all our research. We're, we're private, we're family owned uh, for now. We also focus on remediation efforts. We've got a team of um, hyd hydrologists and soil chemists and mycotechnology, which is these different areas of research that aren't really making money yet for us, but um, mycopesticides is what we're gonna focus on today. It's one of the most fascinating and fun fungi to find. Um, I mean, mushrooms growing out of the brain of an insect, who could not like that? Yeah. <laughs> And especially in, in my area in South Carolina, there's, there's like a cordyceps hotspot. So we're gonna, um, it's been interesting to find. We have over 250 species in our lab that I use for um, not only for cultivation, but also research. And uh, we're also doing trials for um, in environmental importance, trying to clean up the water with pesticides. Uh, we're doing atrazine studies and also persistent herbicide studies. Just so you know how serious we are, we just purchased 50,000 square feet of warehouse space in the middle of nowhere. Um, and this is gonna become our campus. So we do a lot of teaching here. Um, it's a very large facility. And we also have a field here where we're now going to get into mycorrhizal research, which is even cooler. Where are you in South Carolina? Sorry, um, right east of Clemson University. It's um, Liberty, South Carolina. Or I, I sometimes call it lack of liberty. <laughs> Depends. But we have a lab. We put about a half a million dollars worth of uh, money into the lab space. And uh, the design was critical. And uh, this year, um, I'm the president. It's a woman-owned company. My wife's Croatian. And so these are kind of the areas of interest that we're focused on, these different silos of the business. And agriculture is where the entomology division is kind of popping up here. And we did create a little uh, fun moonshot division because we just shot some of our mushroom mycelium up into space. So it's up at the ISS right now. So we're in the space race. But my passion is growing and collecting fungi. And these are golden oyster mushrooms. It's one of the mushrooms we collect. And that's Olga, my wife, collecting oyster mushrooms out in the wild. Um, it's our way of getting new strains. And while we're finding these, we always find something that we weren't expecting. And I know this looks like a concrete mushroom, but that's Macrosibe Titans, the Macrosibe Titans. This one was big enough to sit on, and it would hold your weight, right? Where did you find it? This is in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, we did clone it. This was UPS to my office, and the UPS guy was freaking out when we put it out of the box. And uh, we cloned it, so this mushroom we're actually going to plant in a fairy ring around our fire pit. So we have living stools to sit on right? <laughs> anyway uh, two feet across nine inches across this diameter of the stem just fun things you know and um, I'm not an ID expert I'm good at what I do I'm good at identifying the mushrooms in my area All right this is my daughter she's five she's learning how to ID mushrooms on her own uh, she, one of her favorites is picking chanterelles I pick them and she clips them Oh yeah, just, just some bragging photos. Those are all Lactarius phalemus, and those are all chanterelles, about 40 to 50 pounds one day. 
So, but we don't find, sometimes it takes going out mushroom hunting to find the little ones. And it's the little ones we pass by all the time. And my eyes scan little logs, little trees and branches. All right, so I am no fun to go out mushroom hunting with anymore because I'm the one scanning a log for 30 minutes while you want to go down the trail looking for mushrooms. <laughs> So it takes me longer than it has, um, but I'm fascinated by inter-kingdom interactions and these snare-inducing um, uh, snare fungi, that's just fascinating. And you know, I love showing these to kids because they're like, can that happen to people? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> Watch what happens when you don't clean your room. You know, they're like <laughs> freaking out. So, um, Getting into these entomopathogens, this is out of my book, this little graphic, but it kind of just shows you the different life cycles and stages of some of these fungi uh, existing in a mold state and a teleomorph state. And uh, luckily for me in my area, I, I collect these. There's a lot of them here. So I'm anxious to get out in the woods to see what I can find, what my eyes can find. Because finding cordyceps is like people who can find shark's teeth really well, and you're standing right next to that person, and you're not finding one. But once you find one, then you start finding them, all right? These little cordyceps militaris are on these little larvae here. So if you see a mushroom with these little pitted tops, these little parathesia here, um, not an orange earth tongue or anything, but uh, you see these little bumps and then you see these little threads and then you dig down and that's when you find your little prize. That's the way you know that it infected an insect. So you dig that whole thing up and that helps with identification. So, Here's some of the endopathogens that I've collected, all from South Carolina, all within 10 minutes ride of my house. And once I found the first one, I knew they were out there. I had no idea that there was this many out here. So we got a little wasp here. Uh, Olga spotted this scale on a twig, a sweet gun branch, and all these little horns came out here. And then we cloned it and it got the, uh, the mold culture came back. So this is specific to this little scale insect, right? Uh, Olga's really good at finding these. She found about 30 of this uh, particular uh, species growing out of the, right around the neck, right above the thorax, the, um, a wasp that was buried. And this was completely buried. So right about here, from here to here, was the only visible part above soil. This tiny little thing on the forest floor, very easy to walk past, right? And as soon as you see one, you might see a bunch. So she found 30 in this one area, like a little graveyard. And this wasp had a mushroom growing right out of that little space. Everyone feel that little space right there? All right. Imagine a mushroom coming out of there tonight. <laughs> Better clean your room, huh? <laughs> uh, this is a cicada nymph. Uh, I found this one. A lot of these I was finding by accident because I was photographing a larger mushroom. And right next to my hand was a tiny little cordyceps. Uh, that's how I find most of these is by accident. Uh, because uh, this one's only been photographed a few times, but that's a little nymph. You see the little eyes there. And then in my backyard, I had no idea. I'm uh, walking in my backyard, and that's Gary Linkoff. You ever know who Gary Linkoff is? Yes. Um, Gary's always stayed at my house when he was coming through town, and he became a really good friend, and he passed away last year. But I said, hey, Gary, there's cordyceps in my backyard. And Gary's just like, only your backyard. You know, he's like, Go figure. He goes, you put those there. I, so there it is, growing up the back side of a little branch, and he's just gazing at it um, and looking at these particular entomopathogens are awesome. So Daniel Winkler stopped by our place, too, and we found this particular one with a secondary infection growing out on the teleomorph, coming right out the back of its brain. So if you're not, if you're not familiar with this particular um, organism is that they infect uh, the nerve tissue and the muscles of these ants and they make them crawl and they do um, behavior modification and then they put themselves upside down on the bud scars typically uh, biting in um, melting jaw muscles sometimes and then the mushroom pops out the back of the head straight down uh, and even position wise they'll position themselves over the, the the chemically laced highways that the rest of their buddies are using kind of like a dirty bomb <laughs> and then the, this one got a secondary infection after he took it home and photographed it. So this is my first cordyceps that I ever found. Uh, this one was growing on a log again. I was photographing another mushroom and it just happened to be on the log. And then I dig up this. This is about two inches long. And I actually thought it was a hornet of some sort. 
I'm not an entomologist, so I took it into Clemson. They identified it as a black carpenter ant. And then I sent the specimen to Harvard, Dr. Um, David Hughes, who's now at Penn State. And he said, where did you find this one? I said, um, he goes, we haven't seen it since 1907. And I said, I found it right, at, right around Clemson, right outside on the trail. He goes, you're kidding me. Um, but he goes, this is a queen or a queen to be. So since then, this is five years ago, I've only found five. Uh, they're very rare, this particular one. And we, we managed to clone it. So here's, here's, here started my first insect uh, cloning intima pa pathogen. Um, here she is here. And then all this coming out of the cuticle, but you can see how it's coming out of the legs and the armor there. But uh, all it took was a little bit of a dental uh, tool. You can just uh, bend it like a hook and you can pull some of that tissue out or you can break open the abdomen. It's got a nice solid chunk in there. You can do that. Um, this is what I do on Friday nights. There's no cable. So then you get it purified and then um, under high CO2, it tends to not sporulate so much. And then we just come out here and get the tips and then we transfer it and make grain out of it. But what I did start in doing was starting to reinfect more black carpenter ants so we could know that it was the pathogen of interest. So these were some captured ones that I reinfected. This only took uh, three to four days for this infection to occur. Just three to four days. Was the ant living or not? It was living. Yeah, they are attacked while they're alive. Um, these spores will drill holes right through their armor, right through their cuticle, and sometimes through ingestion. But this one was uh, exterior. Um, after I did that and uh, figured out I could reinfect them, I decided to make uh, fire ant farms in the house. And uh, I pitched this idea to Olga, and I thought this was the last idea she would ever hear from me. So I'm going to make fire ant farms in the house. She goes, no, you're not. Do you all have fire ants here? I brought you some. I put them in my back. Yeah. I've been breeding them to get more cold hardy, too. But anyway, so I made the fire ant farms. I fed them um, a mixture of peanut butter and malt extract mixed with the spores because they feed at different temperatures on proteins and carbohydrates. So no matter what, they ate that. And then within uh, five to seven days, they were all mummified like this. That was the cordyceps from the black carpenter ant culture active against the fire ant culture. This is a big deal in my area, guys. Uh, five to eight billion dollars in damages every year from fire ants all across the southeast. So I started doing some field trials and dosing the mounds. These are the ones that I pulled out of the mounds. We did these field trials at different temperatures. And uh, right now, Olga and I do have not have fire ants at our home, which is eight acres with one dose in five years. And then on our 17 acres, we've got about 85% contained. And we just striped the field because it was a study. So I can walk down my driveway during the summer and there will be a whole line of dead fire ants in a perfect line down my driveway, enough where you could actually scoop them up with a spoon. And you could take those dead bodies, go over to a new fire ant mound and dump them in there, and they all freak out. And that, yeah, you see the guards, they're trying to carry the bodies away, and then the next couple days, that mound is gone. So it's, it's actually a very easy, simple technology in that respect, that if you find infected insects, you can amplify them, but um, that's the way a fire ant should look. <laughs> they're not fun i mean they're they're dangerous people are allergic to them they eat you know baby birds cattle uh, they're very very dangerous uh, but one of my passions is reducing this chemical pressure on our environment and on our groundwater because a lot of those chemicals leach into our drinking water um, so there's a lot of pounds many many billions of pounds of this of these particular compounds that we could replace with potentially more target specific fungi. And there are some on the market. Uh, MET52 was one that was owned by Novozymes until I think uh, Monsanto bought their trademark or patent two years ago. And which makes this one very interesting, it's metarhizium and uh, it's a specific strain, but it's, it's uh, active against varroa mites on bees. And it's also active against brown spotted ticks, which I find is very interesting. But this is broad spectrum. Um, you could use this to initiate an infection, but it probably won't kill them all. And it can potentially kill some innocent bystanders, uh, beneficials. And I don't want that. 
So through Clemson, uh, they let me, these are Clemson University photos where they went to Indonesia and they actually taught the villagers how to create their own pesticides on a, on a grass you know, hut floor. Right? They were, their fields were being eaten up by giant grasshoppers or locusts. Uh, a team went over there. They showed them how to identify the grasshoppers. Then they ground them up and just with a mortar and pestle, uh, something that, that basic. And then they created their own bags of uh, metarhizium and bovaria here. And they were able to share it with other villages. So they completely got off the chemical pesticides that were spraying the fields. Do it in a little hut. And that's what they were going after were these, uh, these locusts. And sure, you could bring them into the, the lab and culture them and all this. But if you find an infected insect like this, you could, you could create more inoculum. Mushrooms are attractants. They provide um, octanols and chemicals, and they attract organisms. So you can use that for vectoring. Um, this is one experiment I did where I took Mycotrol, which is a Botanigard product. Um, Y'all might be familiar with that one. It's pretty much broad spectrum. If you look at the label, it says thrips, grasshoppers, um, aphids. It's a, it's a big list, and I, I don't like that. I want it to be more narrow. So I sprayed these fungus gnats with Mycotrol. Um, that was 100, this was my birthday present. My wife, um, she has a very hard time buying things for me for my birthday. And she goes, just get what you want and uh, I'll wrap it up for you. All right, so I bought 100 virgin fruit flies. Yeah, can't get that at Walmart. 100 virgin fruit flies. And she wouldn't have found out until she saw the credit card statement, you know what I mean? It's, it just said 100 live virgin dot, dot, dot. <laughs> she goes, what did you get? I'm like, they're fruit flies, they're fruit flies. And she goes, what did you get those for? I said, well, I'm curious because, you know, fungus gnats in a mushroom farm, it's a big deal. It's a big problem. A lot of mushroom farmers have this, and even in greenhouse production. So I sprayed that product on here, and out of 100, only two mummified. There was only two that mummified out of 100. It's not a good percentage. So I took those two and I subcultured it. And then I poured that culture, excuse me, I took the rest of these girls and killed them, put them inside of the agar gel and streaked it just on fungus gnat gel. And then that grew. And then I was able to go back by another hundred and keep training that so I get more higher mortality that way. All right, so you can train it forward. Y'all know what these are? So yeah, we don't have those in our area yet. And I really hope uh, there's a, a means and a way for y'all to contain this before it comes down to us. Um, I understand the gravity of the problem, and it's just one car ride away from picking up the next state and the next state. So luckily, I, I do travel a lot, and I show pictures of cordyceps and, and infected bugs. And a woman drove down from uh, Pennsylvania, and she had found several um, spotted lanternflies that were infected, just like the pictures of ants and cockroaches that I was showing uh, over at a Mother Earth Fair. So uh, if you haven't seen this, it's pretty bad. It's spreading pretty quickly. And that's what's got my interest is collecting these insects. So uh, these are the first instars that you might see. And I'm trying to find them uh, infected at a younger stage, but so far we've only found the adults. And I'll show you those. All right, so they're, they're leaf hoppers and they suck at the sap right through the, right through the tissue and they're just decimating orchards. So I'm looking at these different control methods and they're using these sticky mats. Sticky mats seem to be working okay, um, but they're, they also have collateral damage, you know? So they're finding woodpeckers and chipmunks and squirrels. And you know, that's sometimes it's just, you know, you know, loss, acceptable loss. Is this acceptable loss? I don't know, it's, it's hard to see. And then you have these root uh, egg masses that they're saying, well, you can just scrape them off with a credit card. We're not gonna get them all, guys. They're just scraping them off with a credit card. So you have to kind of combine community action and education with, with a, a solution. Right now, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not gonna quote this, but I believe that tree companies are charging about $200 a tree to spray and inject, and it's a lot of money. And they're also encouraging getting rid of these princess trees or the tree of heaven, because that's their preferred host tree. Well, now you're taking away the vectoring site. Um, part of my solution would say, hey, let's keep this tree and then maybe spray it with the entomopathogen or put 
you know, entomopathogen baits out near these trees. So here's what was turned in. These are some of the infected uh, lantern flies, and there's two different fungi working at here. Um, they're, they're, one of them's too long to even pronounce. But this is what we're finding. And um, these are on trees and laying on the ground, and the other one actually affixes the bug to the trees. But you can see this is exactly what some of those ants look like, and all you really need to do is find one. So that's what I'm trying to do now is to at least educate homeowners or anyone. If you find these bugs, if you find a little hot spot, you don't need a lab to do this. You can expand it in a lab, sure, with a very small lab setup. But all you need is one. That's the way a spotter lanternfly should look, you know. But that's covered with canidia. That's infectious spores. Um, so when you find one like this, you can put it in a humidity chamber with a little sponge or a wet paper towel, and then the fungus matures. You get all these infectious parts. Then you can take that one and spray a small population, just like my fire ant culture. And then you can take those 10 or 20, and then you can amplify it and magnify it. <clears throat> if you don't find that spotted lantern fly, you can use a product like this first and try to infect a couple. The few that are infected, then you could take that and um, amplify it forward but yeah that that's covered aphids thrips uh all, all all sorts of different insects but i think that my control has been working so you find an infected bug how do you do this not everyone can afford 200 dollars a tree this is going to spread like wildfire so what we're going to do is we're going to find one infected bug let's say this is the lantern fly you can see how the canidia the spores are starting to form uh, and mature under a high humidity environment uh, you could take this one uh, powder it up in a blender or infect the food, then you've got more that you can infect. So let's say you do a, a small gallery. Now you, have a, um, now you have more biomass here. You take the bugs, you drop them into a blender with some powdered sugar, and then you just strain out the body parts on a Saturday night. This is what you do. They're like, what are you doing, Trad? Sifting body parts. <laughs> and then you have the canidia here that can go into a spray. You can use a traditional sprayer then, it just dilutes. So that's really simple, that's really easy. And this is one of those messages I'm gonna to bring to Pennsylvania, uh, to Burke County, because they need this, uh, they really do need it. What we're trying to do is to focus on specificity, just like the ants, like certain clades, we don't wanna hurt these other clades, and even within these clades, we want to have more target specificity. I don't wanna kill all the ants in my yard, I just want to kill that one or two species of, of red imported carpenter ants. And since we've tried it, we still have native ants wandering the yard, so it's not a broad spectrum pesticide. We're just trying to take out that problematic species. So those are bugs. What about other pests? The EPA would classify pests as also as uh, microbes, microbial pests. Um, several years ago, I did my fellowship at the EPA in Athens, Georgia, and uh, I was away from my lab and my farm for a week at a time, and on the weekend I came back and I see that uh, I see that there's this fungus growing uh, contaminant on my plate, and they have another fungus here. It was beautiful and symmetrical when I left on a Monday. I came back. There's contamination, but I also noticed that it got out of its symmetry, and it surged over the top of this other mold. And then I was checking the resolution of my camera and I saw that there was these little droplets everywhere, which I'm fascinated by. So those are little metabolites and you could see it surge, almost like an army of cells surging. So to me, this fungus was telling me something that uh, number one, it was very territorial. Uh, did not like that other fungus on the plate and they were battling it out. So this is biological warfare. That's simple to see. I also zoomed in and I saw these droplets that it would not produce under sterile conditions. So it's protecting itself like a disinfectant or a novel antifungal compound. <clears throat> All right, so it wasn't producing this, but that's, that's the same plate maybe two to three days later. You could see the, the flux of metabolites. It was serious about getting rid of that other competitor. So I don't use a lot of antifungals in my media, but I just figured out, well, why can't we just induce this fungus to make a novel antifungal compound, and then I could mix that into my media, like my agar media, and now we get uh, inhibition on that particular fungus based on the metabolite that this created. So more of a target-specific fungal 
pesticide. Uh, that fungus was a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Y'all familiar with the jack-o'-lanterns? Beautiful, uh, poisonous to eat, not poisonous to touch. Um, it's a gorgeous mushroom. It's one of those species I have in the lab. And once, once you pull it into the dark, it's absolutely gorgeous, right? It's a lot of fun. So I started growing them, <laughs> right? Um, Heidi came out the same year my book came out, right? <laughs> but um, I, I had these sitting around the house, and I was just growing jack-o'-lantern fungus because I thought, hey, maybe, maybe a, a naturalist would want to plant these along a trail for like an interpretive trail. And sure enough, they came popping out of these bags. And I think I was the first like commercial grower of jack-o'-lanterns anywhere. And um, these particular ones here were, were the ones that were very active. Again, aspergillus. And, and then I would put them away for a while because there really wasn't much to do with jack-o'-lantern. But uh, this also shows you uh, shiitake fungus is on top. And this is an elm oyster culture. You got a white rot going against a brown rot. And then you have this flux of metabolites here lining up right along the DMZ, right? They're getting ready to go to war. And I think that elm oyster is ready. A lot of novel antifungal compounds in the elm oyster species. Shiitake is weak, and those are the tiny little droplets that it was capable of producing. But you could take this metabolite, mix it into agar, or even drop it on the shiitake side, and it'll just fry it. <clears throat> So pests and different bacteria diseases, um, Clemson started sending me pathogens like root rot pathogens, Claritinia root rot, uh, botrytis from strawberry fields. That's all I was doing here. I was trying to induce with these little bags that I'll show you in a minute about creating a novel antifungal antibacterial compound. <laughs> Geneva, please mute. Geneva, please mute. You hear me, Geneva? Are you underwater? Is this the space station? How are things doing? I'm just glad it wasn't me. I was. All right. Like, at least they didn't go to the bathroom. You know what I'm saying? We can edit that part out. Um, so you remember what my birthday present was? There was 100 virgin fruit flies. So Christmas comes around. Always like, oh, my God, what do you want for Christmas? She goes, just go get it. And so I, I opened up a, a pathogen catalog, and I ordered salmonella, E. coli, uh, streptococcus pyogenes, streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, Candida, Pseudomonas, and Staph. And it came to the house. There's a big biohazard sticker on it. She goes, what is this? I was like, Merry Christmas. She goes, I'm not wrapping that up. I was like, you're right. <laughs> so I take it to the farm, and, I, uh, and then I start culturing Staph off of my body, too. Just get it. It's easy to find. Um, so uh, I started to play with uh, different pathogens in all of our mushroom collection here. I've got uh, stored here. And, you know, we've been playing with bird's nest, which is very fascinating for pancreatic cancer cells. That's not part of this talk. Just uh, bird's nests are fascinating. So then I started taking bacterial colonies and, and fungal colonies and making little behavioral galleries, you know. Can you learn from these? Sure. You can learn a little bit about inhibition and behavior. So this is E. coli, and this is the shiitake fungus here. Two pellets uh, dropped in. This is maybe given uh, uh, a day and a half, two days. 24 to 48 hours of incubation time, recovery here. So it's two against one. And then uh, after five replicates, the bacteria basically just swam to the other side as far as they could. And all these are lysed and dead cells here. Shiitake didn't grow out very much. So something uh, diffused into the gradient, into the gel here that created the inhibition, but also killed the cells, some of that E. coli. Shiitake is not that strong. It's a very weak fungus. So we started playing with other, uh, other fungi in our collection. But when then we started to look at, um, we won, Mushroom Mountain won the Clemson Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and their wealthiest alums, uh, alumnus called me the next day. And they're investors with Seventh Generation. Y'all heard of that company? Um, and they wanted to help us. And they said, when we saw your fire ant fu uh, culture um, and, and also the antibiotic research, they said, that got our heart pumping <laughs> as investors. So if it takes 15, 12 to 15 years to make a, a target-specific drug, 
and two and a half years for the bacteria to figure out, that's what we're going after, right? Is these microbial pesticides, uh, not just for antibiotics, but also for disinfectants, you know, that someone could use for hand cleaner or uh, hospital cleaners to clean the hospital beds and the railings. These are all our drug resistant bacteria are, are starting to evolve here. So we started purchasing um, other antibiotics on the market, uh, all these different discs and, and things. And then uh, Clemson allowed us to use their labs for MRSA for some methicillin resistant and VRE, vancomycin resistant uh, E. coli. And this was just in the news a couple months ago. And now this drug resistant fungus spreads, right? These, this is a terrible one. Uh, it's uh, one of these, I think it's a candida. And they are in the news, they are spreading. So how do we stop this? When, when you're blood test comes back or your biopsy or your swab comes back with uh, from the lab and it says R all the way down. There's nothing that doctor can almost do for you except multi-drugs, right? That's a whole panel of resistance. So we started looking into the polypores. If you don't know what a polypore is, these are the bracket fungi, big hoofy things. They, they're perennial conchs and not many people look at these for food because if you can't eat it, who cares, right? Um, you can make a fire out of these. Uh, there's research about these in E. coli. So I took our cultures of this Fomis fomentarius, and uh, I grew them out on blocks like this. And if y'all remember the plates with the mold and those little droplets of sweat, uh, all I want to do is make a lot of it. So I'm just ramping up the biomass, uh, making a little well here, and with the potential of, of taking a throat culture or a swab from a bacteria, a livestock, a patient, the patient could be a plant in the field. I'm just not limiting this to humans and livestock, but also a sick and infected plant. And uh, we take the biopsy, we can drop it in. Uh, this is right through the bag. This is an old design, and now we have injectable ports for pathogens. You know, it's self-healing ports. We can inject those in. This is E. coli. And you can see how the fungus, you see how it uh, healed itself and became hydrophobic? That was a gift because then it held that, that metabolite there. It held the enrichment solution with E. coli here. And then it just started sweating and producing uh, metabolites. So we're not yet sure if this will work with blood samples yet, but it works with living uh, tissue or if it's DNA specific. If it can pick up on what type of organism is in the bag, like this one. So this is the Fomis fomentarius. In went the E. coli inside the well. We do replicates of five for everything, right? So all of them filled with about, that's about 20 milliliters of metabolite. And these are all the controls here with water, right? Sterile water. Uh, the old design, we were just pulling it straight out. But for safety concerns, we have new ones with injectable ports that you can actually pull the metabolite out of. So they're not pulling a pathogen into the room. I think that was important. <laughs> So we pulled out 20 milliliters of this E. coli trigger from this bag. And you know what was interesting is once that metabolite was pulled out of that bag, the bag responded and wanted that metabolite back around it. So it just kept sweating out more and more metabolites. Uh, we've also tried it with maitake, uh, hen of the woods, Griffola frondosa, and a bunch of other strains. So we would pull out the metabolite, we would uh, sterile syringe it, and then we put it on little filter discs and compare those to the kill or the halos we were getting from clindamycin, amoxicillin, and all these other uh, things. But uh, maitake didn't do too well. And I'll show you the ones that won. Uh, we also found this one here, Lentinus tigrinus, and this was the second edition of the bag with a little injectable port uh, and uh, a rehydration. You fill this with water, it, it rehydrates, and you put the pathogen in here, and then it sits on a little riser. So all the metabolite goes to the bottom and you can harvest it right out of the bottom. Um, and if this was injected with botrytis and this fungus was screened to produce a, fungus, a fungicide against botrytis, then all, you would be harvesting this metabolite from the bottom, right? So it could be plant specific and location specific, meaning a field, a little outbreak. And you could do this with farmers. That's kind of where I'm going with this. So there's the pathogen reservoir, water reservoir. That's Lentinus tigrinus. Uh, this is a new fungus we've been working with, and this one was found in uh, Key West, Florida, uh, growing off of an Australian pine stump, and it was growing in the lapping surf, so it's also salt tolerant, 3.5%, uh, which is pretty rare. 
And I've been using this fungus for pathogen galleries and also for remediation galleries in really tough environments because it like plasticizes the mulch. It's got a tensile strength of 800,000 times its own weight. So we're using it for building materials too. Maybe they'll use it to build houses on Mars. I don't know. We'll see. So we could pull this metabolite out. Uh, now we switched to little metal baker's racks in here. And again, this is an older design, but you see the metabolites that are coming out of these particular bags. So we compared our strains. We found that shiitake was highly active against um, staff, but this wasn't the winner. When we took the cultures back to Clemson University, do you remember the jack-o'-lantern? Jack-o'-lantern had some of the strongest activity against MRSA uh, than any of the other strains we had. Jack-o'-lantern, right? It's a poisonous mushroom. Chicken of the woods was also very good. Do everybody know what chicken of the woods is? Bright orange? Chicken of the woods. Orange mock oyster was also really good. What do these mushrooms have in common? Their color. They're, and they also mine sulfur very, very well. Those mushrooms in culture, if you smell the culture, you open up the cultures, it smells like sulfur. Okay, like someone set off a fart bomb in the lab or something. It's really strong. Uh, so the, the orange... Uh, Chicken of the Woods and Jack-O-Lantern seem to be winning the staff race, especially drug-resistant staff. Uh, that's shiitake, and these are all the controls. Turkey tail did the best against killing salmonella, right, by far. It produced a lot of metabolites. These are small little cultures here, and uh, turkey tail was just annihilating the salmonella cultures. Uh, those are all the water controls, DI water. Rishi, the mushroom, uh, Ganoderma, that group, very interesting group. Very strong high activity against strep. A lot of the other mushrooms didn't do too well against strep, but the Rishi one was killing it, uh, killing it really well. So now that we've gotten to this point, we're investigating uh, different ways uh, to make either product development out of this, whether it's something for a throat spray or something like this. Uh, lolly lozenges with Ganoderma extract in it that were induced or made from the bacterial metabolite. Right? I know it's a different direction. If that 20 milliliters or that five milliliters didn't look like a lot, uh, we did dilution studies. So that 20 milliliters was active uh, 10 to the sixth, which means if you diluted it, that 20 milliliters was still active at about 528 gallons. So that's enough to spray a field with. You follow? So taking a small sample from an infected field and in 24 to 48 hours producing that much uh, novel antifungals or bacterial compounds is pretty unique. Um, Anyway, so that's kind of what we're up to now. We're right in the middle of some inhibition studies and we're comparing um, these bacterial lawns to some of the uh, commercial grade antibiotics that are on the market. Um, that does not include the endophytes. So we're not even started with the endophytes yet. And I don't think I'm gonna start now because there's way too much to talk about. Uh, but endophytes that are actually living in the seeds, uh, imparting some uh, drug, excuse me, disease resistance, and those endophytes are actually surface sterilizing 150 different tomato strains from the USDA right now and isolating the endophytes that are in the seeds, not in the plants, to try to see what's in there and what makes them more uh, pathogen resistant in the field. So maybe we'd be able to take those endophytes that are beneficial, put them back into new seeds, and then you have that plant carrying the endophyte forward with the next generation. So that's putting a fungus into a plant to help giving it uh, microbial resistance. Uh, several years ago, one of my mentors at Clemson, Dr. Walker Miller, had uh, some vines with Botchesferia all over it. Uh, I went out to his vines. Uh, I clipped some of the infected wood off, put it in a blender, streaked it on some plates, and I found a trichoderma strain that was novel to his, his field. And we went back and injected it back into his vines at the base and at the top. We actually grew them on, um, just like you're plugging shiitake logs, except we cultured matchsticks. They were really small. We drilled tiny holes. We inserted the trichoderma at the base of the crown and the upper part, and the botchosphere was gone in a year and a half from his fields. Isolated from his fields. I've got a couple more minutes, some fun slides. Can I show them? And then we'll take questions. While I'm here, I flew a long way to get here. 
Um, just so you're interested, um, I'm also interested in morel production and uh, the life cycles. This is Tom Bulk's drawing. And uh, I started looking at the uh, collecting the spores. That's good for academia, right? Is that a good nerd joke? <laughs> All right. A little too risky, Kathy. A little too risky. Um, so then we, um, then we have these little sclerotia and things. And this is what a baby morel kind of starts out as. It's a resting structure of sclerotia. And you have to have chill hours to get these. And I'm out collecting morels uh, in the wild. These are some small ones. <laughs> um, not kidding. Those are actually ash morels. They're pretty get pretty big, and I'm very fascinated. Like you know, I've wrote a book on cultivation. I've grown just about everything, and I'm starting to figure out how to grow morels outdoors. And now we're going to try to transition indoors, but they need certain chill hours. So we're in South Carolina. This is a Georgia weather station. So I track all this weather data, and I start following the ground temperatures warming up in the spring. And then um, that's Olga collecting. This is from a video, but that's how big these morels are. They're huge. Some of them were the size of a two-liter bottle. So after my book came out five years ago, there's a chapter on morel cultivation, experimental techniques. I found out that they were growing morels over in China. Uh, this is acreage under roof, 23,000. All right, that was three years ago. Uh, right now, they're over to 100,000 acres under roof for morel production. All right, so what happens is uh, morels have a very unique life cycle. They like to germinate and nutrient pour, go out and harvest, find their nutrients, and then retranslocate it back into their fruiting arena. And these pictures are from my book where I put them in between the two, non-nutritive and nutritive, and they'd always put their sclerotia back in the non-nutritive part every single time. If you put the, myce if you put the mycelium here, it would not produce the sclerotia at all. It's pretty bizarre. Non-nutritive, this is more nutritive. It put the sclerotia right back on top of itself. All right, non-nutritive, it put it far, far away every single time. So I started growing these in bags, producing the sclerotia in bags like this. You can see them right there on the top. And outdoors, you would plant them somewhat like this in a little layered spawn area uh, in China. They're actually growing them in beds like this. Uh, and this is non-nutritive soil. They plant the spawn. It threads its way through. After several weeks, they put bags that have perforations underneath them. And the mycelium goes up into the bags, mines the nutrients, and it sends the, the nutrients back into the beds like that. So um, if anybody wants to play around with morel production, uh, these, these are very interesting photos, eh? So uh, they lime the soil a lot. They're, they're, they're heavy calcium feeders. Not sure how they taste yet, <laughs> but some of the people are saying, who cares? Look at them. They're going nuts. But it's something to, something to play with. You know, with our native strains here, I don't see why we couldn't do this here uh, in, in certain regions. Those are all the morels. That's what's going on in China right now. All right. I'm going to stop right there.